Talk Genealogy, the podcast for genealogists with too much time on their hands. Here's your presenter, Malcolm Noble. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to episode 12 of the Talk Genealogy podcast. The podcast for the genealogists with too much time on their hands. And since this is number 12 of a monthly podcast... We must be marking our first year. Goodness me, I must have waffled on for something like six hours, yet we seem hardly to have scratched the surface of what we've got to talk about. It's a good job you're not paying for this, or you'd be asking for a refund. I've called this episode Shakespeare for Example. Now what's that all about? Well, scholars have been digging into Shakespeare's life for over a hundred years, some might say hundreds of years. Yet important evidence continues to emerge relatively recently, say within the last 30 years, a mere smidging of time in the scheme of things. And by looking at the sources of information about his life, I hope to demonstrate that the broader our approach to sources, the richer the vein we are likely to uncover. So no, this won't be a detailed biography, nor even a trail of genealogical evidence. Rather, I want to approach Shakespeare's history to see what it can tell us about the value of different sources, how and how much we should use them. But you know, it's about more than sources. I'm sure that we can learn by looking at how historians from a slightly different discipline approach their detective mysteries. This seems a worthwhile question, because Shakespeare lived through Tudor and into Stuart times, a period that could be something of a stumbling block for genealogists. And any help is welcome, and all those literary historians digging away for all those years, what can we learn from their experiences? But first I need to remind you that I am neither a professional nor an expert. I am an enthusiast like you, who has spent more than 50 years digging up his family tree. And these podcasts are really no more than me sharing with you some of the lessons that I've learned along the way. I need to emphasise that I'm talking about ancestor hunting in England. Neither am I a Shakespeare scholar. Okay, sometimes I like to think of myself as one, but no, I'm not really. So although many people may want to question the Shakespearean side of this podcast, I hope you will allow that I'm using it for illustrative purposes only. My goodness, what a broad range of sins that phrase can cover. Shakespeare was born in 1564, about a generation after the commencement of parish registers, but from the time that uh, most of the registers survive. This was also the time of the strengthening of the parish vestry. Queen Elizabeth was on the throne, of course, but memories of Bloody Mary's reign were still fresh in many minds. Catholicism remained a threat, and Shakespeare was still a young man, only 24, when the Spanish Armada played out its aborted attempt to invade our island. Shakespeare married in 1582. We don't know where, but certainly not Stratford. There followed his lost years. He wasn't lost, of course, but he left not much in the way of documented footprints. He may have known some wisdom in that. Legend says that he shot Lord Lucy's deer and ran away. More credibly, he may have spent time teaching in a private house in Lancashire. But surely it cannot be irrelevant that significant members of Shakespeare's maternal family, the Ardens, were executed for treason during this time. From 1585-ish, Shakespeare, the upstart crow, appears in London as part of a bustling community. His years of fame followed. By 1600, on the eve of the Essex treason, Shakespeare's troop was in trouble for staging Richard II, a play about usurping the throne. Of course they knew what they were doing. Come on, get real. But they did get away with it. And Shakespeare was in London around 1605, the year of the gunpowder plot, sponsored in the main by Midland and Warwickshire families. Around 1611 he retired to Stratford, though he continued to write, and leaving a will and a second best bed to his wife, he died in 1616, probably from typhoid fever, some people say after a binge. 
So how can that story help us with our family history research into Tudor and Stuart times? Well, let's start with Wills. Whenever we find a new grandfather, we must want to find out about his mother-in-law. This will be a new branch of the family tree. It always is. In Shakespeare's case, even respectable genealogists might have started jumping up and down with excitement because John Shakespeare's wife was an Arden, and the Ardens of Warwickshire were one of the few families who could trace their pedigree back to the years before the conquest. And Shakespeare's story shows us how important it is for us to check the father-in-law's will. It will tell us about family relationships, their standing and wealth, but something else in this case. The phraseology of Robert Arden's will, and especially referring to the Virgin Mary, indicates a strong adherence to the old religion. And that is an important indication of his circumstances at the time, and a likely hint to young William's upbringing. So there is an early lesson for us. Perhaps checking out father-in-law's will should be an early to-do with each new generation. Regular listeners will know how much I value Tudor wills, so I am wary of re-emphasising it here. But turning to two other wills may make us make a deeper and more productive use of them. Firstly, Shakespeare's own will. The one where he famously left his second best bed to his wife. I'm thinking of leaving my second best guitar to my wife, the number one having been buried with me. Shakespeare made several last-minute amendments and additions to his will. There is an argument that he had a clear understanding that he was dying, probably suffering from typhoid fever following a drinking session with Ben Jonson. I say, an evening with Shakespeare and Ben Jonson, hey, what I would have given to have been there. Do these amendments show the state of his mind as he faced death? By this time, William Shakespeare was barely strong enough to sign the will, and certainly the last-minute bequests are of a personal nature, recognising his closest friends and tokens that he would like them to remember him by. So these bequests may be small, but they probably tell us quite a bit about the man, his life and the world about him. And this is the lesson which I would like us to draw from this example. Give proper attention to codicils. They are not mere extras, but can be definite clues to what is going on. A bad harvest, an unwise marriage, enclosures, changes in the parish officers, codicils to wills can present us with the greatest treasure of family history work, a detective story to solve. You're listening to Talk Genealogy with Malcolm Noble, the podcast for genealogists with too much time on their hands. For the third world, we need to travel north from Stratford and look into the archives of a Lancashire country estate. Here, in a late 16th century will, a descendant of the family is asked to be friendly with a Mr. Shakestaff, believed by some historians to be William Shakespeare, who spent some of his lost years teaching the family children, no doubt in the Catholic tradition. Now, some listeners may want to dispute this identification. It does make sense to me, but I agree making sense is not the same as it being established. But for the purposes of this podcast, looking for how Shakespearean research can guide the family historian, I would like us to consider two aspects of the content of the will. Firstly, it presents another detective story. What does friendly mean? Does it have anything to do with Catholic conspiracy or their persecution? What had Shakespeare done to deserve or require such friendliness? And was there any evidence of the friendliness being delivered? Now, if we found such a phrase mentioning our own ancestor rather than Shakespeare, I'm sure our curiosity would be excited. And why shouldn't we? After all, Shakespeare was no more than a household teacher, a servant at the time. It was a clue to the life of an ordinary, unremarkable fellow. And secondly, Shakespeare was neither a family member nor a business associate, so anyone looking for his name might have overlooked this will, not even calling it up to the search room. 
Now, in this case, the will is famous because the family have uncovered Shakespeare's name and are happy to promote the family connection, not to mention literary scholarship. But if celebrity had not been the case, the only clue would have been the location and the religious commitment of the household. And here is the next lesson that we can take from Shakespearean research. If we are stumped, want to know more about a neighbourhood, and want to attach names to the landscape, look at contemporary wills. They are jam-packed with evidence for the genealogist. There is another lesson that we can take from this example. Historians seeking to corroborate their thesis that William Shakespeare spent some of his lost years in this household have uncovered that Shakespeare's school teacher was friendly with the family. I wonder how many genealogists would have looked for a similar connection if they were hoping to establish a name's identity. So, as far as wills are concerned, there are three lessons which the Shakespearean scholar can teach the family history buff. Recognise the importance of wills to the understanding of the community. Recognise the importance of codicils, spend some time on them, and put the will of any new father-in-law on the early to-do list. Now let's have 20 seconds of music before we take a further look into the work of the Shakespearean scholars. There are show notes for this episode and of course all the previous episodes on the website talkgenealogy.wordpress.com The website also includes a full bibliography of the books I have mentioned in the series along with an occasional wordy blog. I also put any links that might apply to a particular episode on the relevant show page. That's talkgenealogy.wordpress.com Now I want to turn to parish records, town records in Stratford's case. But for most of us looking at Tudor families, we will need to lift the lid of the parish chest. The main evidence for William Shakespeare's social profile and early life comes from records of his father's public life. We find out that his father progressed to be an alderman of the town. Mary Arden may have married beneath her status, but John Shakespeare was aspiring. He had an eye on being upwardly mobile. Now, before William had established his own status in the world, his father's progress stumbled into bankruptcy, public naming and loss of office. We'll look at the reasons for this later. The lesson? We would be unlucky if a trawl of the vestry records or records of local governance did not add to our knowledge of our family's social profile. And we know that social profiling is the best guide to future research. And perhaps it will add one or two milestones to the timelines of our ancestors' lives. It did in Shakespeare's case, the son of a glove maker on the make. So why not in yours and mine? By the late 1580s, Shakespeare had moved to London, and here I want to narrow our focus. There were, in spite of what many people will tell you, soon several mentions of Shakespeare's emerging success as a writer. But that evidence is so peculiar to his genius that it would be unrealistic to expect our ancestors to be spoken of in the same circles. OK, I know what you say, who knows, but, well, let's say, probably not. So I want to stick to those sources of information about Mr Moore Average. And next, I want to look at how productive a search can be, even if it's unsuccessful. Gobbledygook, hey, stay on board and let's see where we get to. In 1884, William Rendell, a local historian for London, submitted a paper to the Genealogist magazine, enthusing about some old books in St Saviour's Church, Southwark. There is a considerable number of common-looking books some foot or more long, by five or six inches wide, which appear as if extemporised for a childless shop, 
some with paper covers ragged enough, some altogether without. These are token books, containing names of persons above the age of 16, and also naming the courts, streets, and alleys in which they lived, and the number of leaden tokens taken by each which are to be delivered up when the holder takes the sacrament, all persons above 16 being, as it were, compelled to do so. These books are for the whole parish, two or three for each year, one that is for each district of the parish, street side, the clink, and the liberty of Paris Garden. I think these books, some of which have, one time or another, been lost, torn, or purloined, are of unquestionable value. They range from about 1587 to 1646, or thereabouts. Rendell was desperate to find a reference to William Shakespeare, who we know was living in the area at the time. But for all his searching and imagination, he came up with no entries for Shakespeare. What he did produce was a vibrant description of the area which Shakespeare would have known well. We have the names that we recognise, the names of those alleys and butts, the taverns, we can almost hear the revelry. But bear in mind that other scholars have searched for centuries across the archives for any and every mention of Shakespeare. It still goes on. And so I think that the lesson for the genealogist is that even if a search of, for example, vestry records does not turn up our ancestors' name, the search is so valuable for increasing our knowledge of their world, and we are bound to use that knowledge in future when we are scratching our heads about the next place to search. And so, lesson five, searching is good for its own sake. We know that. Take Shakespeare, for example. That paper, by the way, is available online, and I'll provide a link on the show notes. There are other encounters which help build up a picture of Shakespeare's life in London, and most are brought together in Charles Nichols' book, The Lodger, published in 2007, just ten years ago. By using documentation of a court case, Nichols wanted to write a filled-out account of Shakespeare's life in Silver Street, London. However, what he produced, who knows by accident, is a first-rate example of how to interpret and write a family history. That is why I am recommending it. I'll pop the details in the bibliography at talkgenealogy.wordpress.com. The court case concerned a financial dispute between members of the Mountjoy family. The father had promised a diary which was not delivered. The documentation shows that William Shakespeare, a gentleman, was lodging in the house and he was called to give evidence. Now, this reference to Shakespeare was first found in the court rolls as long ago as 1909 by William Charles Wallace. He published his findings in Harper's Monthly in 1910. Wallace was a colourful character, though well able to irritate people in his day. He was from Missouri, born in 1865, and really he mined documents in archives like a prospector. And working in London's Republic Records Office, he did much to add to Edwardian knowledge about the Renaissance Theatre in London, and he published his findings in the first London theatre, Materials for a History. But Nicol wanted to learn about the stories behind the court case, and Gentleman Shakespeare in particular. The decision of the court was no decision. The court noted that the parties came within the purview of the French church, which would be better place to provide a judgment. The French church, remember the Huguenot migration, had led to many ethnic centres in London at the time, and the French church was one example of that. So Nicol went on digging. By now he knew he was building a picture of the community. 
Through Silver Street he went on digging, through the house on the corner, its shape and occupants, through their trade and work. It seemed that there was no stopping his digging, and if the genealogist goes on digging in the same way, he will get to know the lives of his ancestors. I suppose the general lesson here that the Shakespearean scholars can teach us is to look out for a promising detective story and bury ourselves in a wide variety of sources. But there's more to it than that, isn't there? It's about knowing our subject, the village, the family, the vestry or whatever, so that that knowledge can guide our research. Shakespeare's name and the name of his father crops up in a number of legal disputes, both in London and Stratford. Generally, they are to do with trade and property, two factors that always make a dispute more likely. But the records of similar proceedings are always worth checking, especially if we are talking about a small village, because of the possibility of our ancestors being mentioned as witnesses or being affected by the dispute. There are two more features that I want to bring forward before I run out of time. Perhaps this podcast should have been delivered in two parts. I want to get across the importance of matching your ancestor's life against national history. Maybe he did not affect the country's destiny, but his country almost certainly shaped his. Throughout his life and the lives of others in these circumstances, of course, Religious tolerance was a perpetual background to Shakespeare's day. But with Shakespeare, we can see that the rebellion of Essex played an influential role, and also the gunpowder plot of 1605. A Stratford neighbour was a peripheral suspect, and that could have happened to anyone in the area. So we need to be alert to what is going on beyond the bald documentation in the parish registers, tax returns or court disputes. Enclosure, industrialisation and migration, of course, but also specific events like Oliver Cromwell's recruiting drive through East Anglian villages, unrest between town and gown in Oxford, the Glorious Revolution or the paranoia about English spies in London in Edwardian England. And the final lesson, never believe that the genealogist cannot be wrong. We have been unable to locate a parish register that recalls the marriage of Anne Hathaway to William Shakespeare. In some probables, pages are missing. In other cases, registers are missing. All the registers are there, but there is simply no mention of them. They certainly did not marry in Stratford. However, we know that William Shakespeare was granted a marriage license in Worcestershire at the correct time. Was this because the vicar conductor services in the old fashioned, old religion way that Shakespeare preferred? Also, his wife, Anne Hathaway, was visibly pregnant at the time. No, no, not with the bastard child of Edward Dyer. Please, we must keep our feet on the ground. And the bride and groom wanted a hurried marriage before the closed seasons. Remember, at this time, marriages were generally not conducted during Advent or the festival weeks in January. But there is a more puzzling aspect to this wedding. The entry in the register licenses a marriage of William Shakespeare to Anne Watley of Temple Grafton. But this was clearly a mistake. The vicar wasn't paying attention, his memory was playing tricks on him, but the genealogist will have no truck with such pleadings. The record licenses a marriage between William Shakespeare and Anne Watley of Temple Grafton. There is no reason to suppose that the bride was Anne Hathaway from miles away. I don't care, says a genealogist, that William and Watley had no children. And there's no evidence of William's birth in the surrounding parishes. We must stick to the facts. And the facts, says the register, is that William married a Watley. There were clearly two William Shakespeare's. Oh dear, no, please, one's enough. However, for researchers who go the extra mile, the bishop's transcript does refer 
to Anne Hathaway. And a surety offered by friends relating to the marriage refers to Shakespeare and Anne Hathaway. The lesson for the genealogist is not simply to dig further and do the thing properly, but also never forget that you might be wrong. I suppose there are two overriding lessons which these examples point to. Know the history of the time and place and know your sources. You know, I can sense a complaint. Of course, all these sources termed up trumps. Many historians have been searching them for many years because it's Shakespeare. But surely we are going to follow our family history search for years and years. So many stories of successful genealogy come out of decades of patient, dogged research of dry and dusty documents. That is what we're about, you know. That is the genealogist with too much time on their hands. Thank you for listening to episode 12 of the Talk Genealogy podcast. Tonight's talk has been a little different, because instead of focusing on one source or one aspect of our subject, I've tried to illustrate how we can learn from historians of a different discipline. I hope that our rattle through Shakespearean research has prompted some thoughts and ideas about your own family history project. Don't forget to get in touch if you have any thoughts or comments or a family history story that you'd like to tell. Can I remind you that the show notes for tonight's episode can be found on the website talkgenealogy.wordpress.com The next episode will be posted at 7.30pm UK time on the 3rd of August and will be about the hearth tax returns, unless I change my mind. My thanks to Freeze Effects for the music, Emily Brooks for the voiceover, and thank you for listening. Good night and God bless. <laughs>